Okay, so uh, good morning, and it's a gorgeous morning. Although I have to say, anybody come here from outside? That sounds like it's cold out there. Uh, it didn't look so cold, but it looked beautiful. Uh, I'm here to talk about cheap learning. And I, I use that term not necessarily in a pure technical sense, but just to kind of juxtapose it with deep learning, which is the stuff that you need all the math for and so on. What I'm going to talk about today is stuff that's unredeemably practical. It, it's stuff that you can apply. It's stuff that you can use. There's some deep mathematics that underlies it. There's some very uh, cool stuff under there. But it can be packaged in a way that's predictable and easy to use. Now, the, the results that you get are going to be pretty impressive if you use it well. I'm Ted Dunning. Uh, here's contact information. I work for MAPR. I volunteer for Apache. What else? Uh, O'Reilly author. And I'm, today I'm just opinionated. Uh, but you can get to me by n number of email addresses or by Twitter or whatever. You can find me on GitHub where I put a lot of this stuff out uh, as open source. We can do that. So today I'm going to talk about the problem primarily, a lot of detail into the problem that we face uh, in building our systems, some techniques, some practical techniques for how to build solutions for this, and then particular ways to apply it. And <clears throat> in particular, the goal here is to take a very complex distributed system and start from the user's point of view and give helpful hints about what are the likely causes of problems. And also, frankly, to be able to d discern whether there are problems. Uh, I mean, who here has had a situation, a user comes to you and says, something's broken. And you go, oh, really? What? And they go, I don't know. But it seems slow. What's slow? Well, I'm not sure. Do you have any evidence for this? They go, well, no, it just feels slow. It's like, great. You know, and, and so the, it's a very short step from there to very asocial behavior. I can fix that. I just delete your program, uh, that sort of thing. It's not slow anymore. Uh, but it would be much better if you could say, well, tell me what you're talking about, and you could compare different versions or different times, different runs. You could look and you could actually see, ah, see something is worse. You could drill in and find what that is. That's what we really would like. It's no fun being asocial and having people make up fun of you. So I'm going to show here, just this is one thing that one of our customers does. They collect metrics. It doesn't matter. We don't care what their metrics are. They stick it in a stream. The stream magically replicates to a central cluster. And they do this from 50 or so data centers. OK, that's pretty straightforward. And then in the central data center, they have processing that elaborates the events, stores it in tables, stores it in streams, stores it in files, produces pretty pictures. From the user point of view, from the person's point of view, where they're analyzing the data, they have a very simple idealistic view of what the system looks like. There's a stream there. The stream lives in uh, an extended file system, has a path name. Uh, you can run standard software against it. You can push the events out. You can do real time. You can do back sort of thing. You can have tables in the file system, all of that sort of thing. You can use open source software like Elastic Search or Drill to analyze it. It's a very simple thing. But trying to help the user understand What's working or not involves drilling into the system underneath that. This is my little bit of freedom here that I can pace around the room if I have that. Uh, okay, so if we have that system, what's really happening a little bit underneath is that there's directories and there's things called volumes. The volumes are the triangles. And ultimately, the streams live down inside of these volumes. There may be directories which are not volumes. 
The volumes themselves are made up of containers. Now, these are not containers in the Kubernetes system sense. These are data containers. There's one privileged container, which holds metadata, and then a bunch of data containers. Uh, the table itself is divided into key ranges, and there's multiple levels of division, ultimately down to a segment, which is the thing that has the write-ahead cache and does the actual insertions. The segment is stored into a container, a particular container. Segments are constrained to be small. The containers are stored on a particular machine in a storage pool, and then they're magically replicated to other things. And the storage pool actually talks to real storage devices. Good. And then there's all these processes, of course, that control that. The, the MFS, that's the actual file system process, is the one that actually controls I.O. to the devices. But there's a container location database that remembers where the different containers are and what the replication pattern is. There's a MAST, which is a gateway for the magic stream replication that we saw. So we have quite a lot of mechanism going on. The user had that very, very simple view that this thing way back here, way back in history, uh, they say, there's a stream. It lives in my directory. Well, they don't realize their directory is actually a volume. They don't realize exactly where all of this is in the cluster. They probably don't even quite realize which machines their programs are running on because they use something like Kubernetes. It's a very, very long ways from their simple view through all of these abstractions down to the hardware. We want to go from there to there. We want to find the faults here and reflect them back up in some understandable way. Now, unfortunately, uh, all of those actions that the user's software does results in very complex actions. It isn't just a structure that's complex. And of course, the system is built in a very asynchronous way. We try to avoid keeping any state in the core system, keep that at the peripheral where this program is actually running, where the state is natural. But that means that the core system has very, very little contextual information in order to do fancy logging. And things are happening very, very fast. We can have 50,000 threads that are live on a single core. You could have four cores running this file system. That could be spread across a 1,000 nodes. And so it's just hell on wheels trying to make sense of this for a user. And we really, really want to attribute user visible behavior back to hardware sensible faults. This is the problem we're trying to solve. And the moral here is, of course, that it's a long road from users to hardware. And the road has gotten longer over time. Back on an Apple II, you got an idea how many cycles everything was. But here, it's so far away that this hazy in the distance sort of thing from the point of the user, user's thing. Now, the system is complex when it works well. What happens when a disk drives, dies? Or what's worse is when it doesn't really die, it just becomes obstreperous and slow. Well, that's terrible. Or, or a network link gets misconfigured. Or you know, the, the behavior of an SSD changes radically when it gets full. Suddenly, you get more and more delays, and you get very oddly structured latencies. Uh, what happens when some other job runs at the same time or at a surprising time? We, we had a. A user, so it's, it's wonderful to have these perverse users, but it's frustrating at the time. We had one user who was insistent that it was very important to keep their hardware costs as low as possible. So they'd use two repl tw replication two instead of three. That's a little bit more dangerous because if you have two disks that get lost in short succession, you lose data. They used one gigabit networking instead of 10 gigabit networking because the hardware came for free back then. They ran all of their file systems at 90 plus percent full as opposed to kind of the recommended 70 percent full. And 
then they had some persistently misconfigured networks, so some networks were slower than others, and then they lost an entire chassis with 32 disks in it. So how do you deal with situations like that? How do you know what's going on? Is it software action? Is it hardware action? Who do you blame? What happens when something changes? Some of our users run 500,000 jobs in a day that are all scheduled, and they really want to know what the impacts are. What happens when a new model gets deployed, and so on? It's complicated. We want to find the cause of things, the true cause. We're not going to do that. We're not going to have a magic diagnostic program. But what we would really like is something that goes, I think you ought to talk to him. That sort of thing. Just suspicions, educated suspicions. OK, so let's talk about this. Now, I'm going to talk about a number of techniques that fall into some several categories. One is I'm going to talk a little bit about latencies. Gil Tana talked about latencies in his keynote. And latencies really have a wonderful property, especially when you dig in not just to the end-to-end -end application level latencies, but every disk write, things like that. There's certain wonderful properties of latencies. Mostly, you can't hide. If latency is bad, you can never make it better again in a, some complex operation. So that's good. And I'm also going to talk a lot about distributions of values. Not pointing a finger at an individual measurement, but saying this collective, this distribution of measurements that I'm seeing smells kind of bad. Now, that's a an important thing to be able to do because with a collection, we can make these trendy kind of decisions rather than having to see one evil transaction. We can be looking at them in aggregate and start pointing in, and we can see things more easily. And I'll talk about how we can do that with latencies, but also how we can do it with any kind of quantities. So if the application has anything to measure, we can look at collectives of those measurements. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how counting and how comparing counts can give us the final thing, which is the final pointer, the, the, you know, the long hand of the law sort of thing. Now, let's talk about latencies. Latencies are beautiful because everything has them. Even if you don't think about it, if, you know, if you are some irresponsible application developer, I speak now as a systems person, uh, then you may not think about the latency, but the system sees lots and lots of latencies. Every time you do a, a table write, there's probably 10 or 20 disk writes that ensue from that. Every time you do a directory scan, there's hundreds of disk operations there's RPCs that happen. Every one of those has latencies. So every application, no matter what it does, we have latencies that we can talk about. And so this, this idea that we can make measurements about how a program runs without knowing anything about it other than it's running is really, really cool. And if we can tag these in, in certain ways, then, then we might even be able to do more than that. So, here are some latencies. Uh, now, this is a sad story. It's a new laptop. It's actually a new old laptop. It's an old laptop, but it's new for me. And I just reinstalled everything. This is why I'm using Google Slides instead of PowerPoint, because I forgot. Who would know that I needed PowerPoint coming to a conference? Uh, but the thing is, I ran the same test on the old laptop, which was 95% full, and I got bizarre latencies. I ran the exact same test on comparable hardware, which is now 30% full, and I get wonderful latencies with no bizarre behavior. Sad, but true. But here is what looks what good behavior looks like. It's got big spikes in there. How bad are the spikes? Well, we need to talk about it, and we need to talk about how we can visualize it. So the first technique to talk about here, the first idea here, is if you think about latencies, if we took, look at that 10 millisecond number, the accuracy of that, you know, the difference between 9, 10, and 11, it's not so big. It's kind of like the difference between 90, 100, and 110. It's like 9, 10, or 11 microseconds. We care about relative accuracy in measurement space. OK? 
Okay? That's a neat thing because we can start counting how long things take with a histogram that has bins that are bigger and bigger. And we can actually figure out which bin to use using the exact floating point representation. And so by dividing things into power of two and then each power of two has bins, we can do some very nice things there. And we can then visualize these results. Now here is a raw histogram of those latencies. There's one bin, and I've, I've, I've divided it into very, very, very tiny bins that has almost all the measurements. And look at that, there's another bin that has some information. And then there's several hundred other bins that have information that we can't see. So a normal histogram is completely useless to try to talk about this. Let's talk about some tricks. Here's some synthetic data, not, not the data, the real data, but it, it's synthetic and nice because we can experiment with it. Here's what good data looks like, and here's what data looks like with 1% operations that are three times slower. As again, the, the histograms are not useful. But what we can do, we want to see that stuff out there. What we can do is we can change to use those exponentially sized bins. See, they get bigger as the measurements get bigger. So the accuracy in measurement space is always relative and constant. And here's the original data now presented in this different form. And the counts are bigger out here because the bins are bigger. And then we're also displaying it on a log axis. So the vertical scale now is sensible and it's 10 to the seventh range. And we can see, for instance, this is all writes, and this is writes that are to offsets more than a gigabyte. In the old system, the, the one that was nearly full and was misbehaving, this one had a tail that went way out here to 150 milliseconds, and the normal writes did not. So we can now see these changes. And here is the data, you remember the, the synthetic data with 1% bad values added? <clears throat> we can now see those bad values. So seeing something already is an important change. And that's only visible when we get this vertical scale fixed and when we have these progressively larger bins. Uh, Gil displays all of his data on a different way. He always uses a horizontal axis, which is the log of the cumulative residual and his vertical axis is time, but it's the same data. So we can now see small changes with that logarithmic th change and with some of those things, okay? That's idea one. Idea two is that we can also look at how the world behaves in a large system by just looking at the rate things occur. And interestingly, if we have even as few as five users out there, the operations that they will impose on a system will now be statistically beautifully distributed according to a Poisson, and that means that we can look at the inter-arrival time for events and use that as a key system diagnostic. We don't even have to think about latencies, just how often do those things occur. We want to, so latencies help us diagnose inside the system. We want to now diagnose the world. Has the world changed as opposed to that? So here, for instance, are times between events. Again, this is synthetic data. I'll show real data in a moment. And you can see that the times are very long. These are at night. These are during the day. The traffic is faster and stronger during the day, so the intervals are short, and they're long at night. Here's the actual rate that I used to generate that data. But when we scale by that rate, we get numbers that look like this, which have a wonderfully constant distribution so that we can see when things are happening. So if we could just predict the rate, what should be happening right now and into the near future, we could scale that and we could just look at first order differences and set alarms very easily. Now we can build a predictor very easily. This is actual data from Wikipedia in 2008. And this, I believe, is the web page for Christmas. 
and in November, we're coming up on Christmas and so on. And what we did is we took the current rate for this hour and we gave it lagged values. One hour ago, two, three hours ago, 24 hours ago, 48 hours ago. And we built a model based on this, a very, very simple model that uses the recent few measurements and some older measurements to predict what the measurement should be one hour ahead. The result, this is for a model that was trained on November and tested on December. And the behavior of the Christmas web page changes radically in here. But you can see that the prediction is very tight coming up here. And then even when things go crazy over Christmas, we still have decent predictions one hour ahead. And that means we're going to get decent normalization of those inter-arrival times. So adding prediction is a wonderful thing, and it's really pretty easy to do. These are... We don't need big data. We can do a few thousand measurements to build that model. We can build it in R, we can build it in Python, lots of things to do. We can predict counts. We can predict what inter-arrival times should be. And if you think back to that histogram, each bin in there is a count. And that means we can use this kind of model on each count, and we can predict what it should be, and we can find discrepancies, two techniques in place now. We can look a little bit more into these distributions. If we know something about your application, who here has some application or has some user who has an application? Anybody? Give me a break, yeah. Now, you can know something. For instance, they get a result, right? What is the size of the result? That's a reasonable measurement. If it's like a fraud score that, that's being returned, the score itself is an interesting measurement. Now, these things are not like latencies. We don't know what the distribution of these things are in general. So we need to talk about distributions in a much more general sense. And there's a, a very simple algorithm that I built, simple from the user's point of view, where you just add numbers in, and then you can ask it, for the 99th percentile, the 99.99th, or you can give it a measurement, 11 milliseconds, and it'll tell you what the percentile is. And it'll tell you very, very accurately at the tails, and pretty damn accurately in the middle. We don't really care about that. But one thing we can do is we can take one week of history and build a distribution out of that, and then we can say, give me the 90th, 99th, 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 four nines, five nines, six nines, those values. And then I stick that into the last minute of data and say, what are the counts between those particular measurement values? So now I have now counts for the new data, I have counts for the old data, and I can compare those counts. But this data structure allows me to take the new data with any distribution it has, I can take the old data with any distribution it has, and I can turn those into counts that I can compare. The idea here is we've got, say, model scores, or whatever measurement you got, we can put it into a T-Digest, and every minute we can store the T-Digest. Takes about a kilobyte for a pretty accurate data structure. And we could add those up to get one hour or one day measurements. We can take those percentiles out of there and apply those to the one minute digest that we just had, and then we can compare those integers. Here's an example. This is running, the, each panel is running at a different number of transactions per second. And we're comparing each minute to the previous hour. And each sub-panel has different levels of corruption. The left subpanel has no corruption. The middle panel has 0.1% of the transactions which are shifted a little bit. Not even grotesquely shifted. The, the distributions still overlap. And then the last panel has 1% of the corruption. In the middle here, we have 100 transactions per second. So at 0.1% and a minute, we're gonna have 6,000 transactions in a minute, we're going to have six corrupted transactions in the minute. 
and they're barely corrupted. And you could almost see, you could still see at 1%, we could see it at 0.1%, we might be getting a positive measurement there, but this is practically impossible. At the 1% level, we're gonna get 60 transactions out of 6,000 in the minute that have some level of small corruption. So, and at the 1,000 transactions per second, and think about this, this is, for instance, disk writes or, or things like that. 1,000 of those per second across 1,000 nodes is falling completely asleep. The fact that we're doing that few things at that rate is actually a very, very low thing. We're not necessarily talking about application transactions. We're talking about any kinds of tr transactions we can measure, and not just latency. And here you can see 1% corruption, like one disk out of 100, one node out of 100 being perverse, one model out of 100 instances in a service being out to launch or here, one out of a thousand, both of those are clearly visible within a minute by using these distributions. These scores are calculated by taking those counts I told you and forming one row of a little counter table and another row of a table and passing it again to a very, very simple statistical test that says, are these two rows different? And the score is the level of difference. So, the result of this fourth technique is that comparing counts gives us very interesting detectors. Now, when we put things together, we can start tagging the measurements. So if I have a disk write and I'm doing the latency thing or I'm doing some other thing, I can tag that disk write with the disk that I'm writing to, the machine that the disk lives on, the table that that disk write is associated with the user ID, who's doing the right, and their job name and the version. There's, there's probably a dozen tags or so. And within a short period of time, 10 seconds, a minute, there's only gonna be a few thousand unique tag combinations on any given machine. And so over a minute, if we're writing down a kilobyte for each tag combination histogram, we're gonna have maybe a megabyte a minute of log data. It's really quite modest. Now the cool thing about this, and this is where we come very much to the point where we want it to be, is that we can have these histograms record the tags, and we can draw this diagram as before, and the user can say something is different out here between those two versions. And the user can draw a circle here and say this region, what is different in the red curve here versus here? Or they can say in general, what is the difference at each point between the red curve and the black curve? This is a very userable operation there. This is messed up. What is different about it? And what we can pull out then is by using these count comparisons which tags have strongly different counts as measured by these distributions, either from the reference of correct operation or slow versus fast? Those can be the two rows that we compare. Which tags have slow versus fast rows of their counts that are different? Which tags have reference versus problematic that are different? And what pops out of that immediately is that disk. Oh yeah, this machine. But of course the machine will have a much less strong signal because it's got several disks, not just the problematic one. That's if we have a bad disk. And so the user can actually draw the circle and the list will pop out and it'll say, looks like this disk is a problem. Or if they're hot spotting one table, their table will pop out as the interestingly different thing. So we can actually do some very, very strong statistics that make that leap all the way from user understandable measurements all the way back to diagnostics of hardware. Now these are not really diagnostics because the system is not saying, you know, these things have happened to this particular hardware. It's just taking all the lists of thousands and thousands and millions of possible causes 
and reducing it to a list of five or ten. But that means that we can change that social conversation that we described at the beginning where user comes to me and they say something's broken. If we could draw the circle and I can pop out and it says this disk is problematic and I can now look at the measurements for that disk, I can say to them, damn, you're right, I'll fix that. And in the meantime, I will blacklist that node and, and we'll get some data off of that. And you'll be fine. That's the conversation I'd like to have. And that's the conversation these four very simple techniques really bring out. And, and in terms of actual software, there's the nonlinear histogramming, there's the t-digest, and the ability to compare counts. That's really all there is. These are all available in standard software packages quite easily. And I'm building examples now that will show people how to use this. This is already being used by Microsoft and by Netflix and by Google, by other systems at really, really large scale. But it's, it's actually quite easy to do. That's why it's been adopted so widely, is precisely because it's so simple. Now, that's what I mean by cheap learning. None of this was that complicated. It's just different from the way people normally looked at things. The tagged distributions, the, the latencies, the log histogram, the event model with scaled time differences, decimating in measurement space by using the t-digest, visualization with a little bit of special tricks, and the tagging to find the causes give us the capabilities that we wanted at the beginning of the talk. There's pictures, just to remind you if you're a visual kind of person. Now we've got quite a bit of time now to talk about this. I can go into either the details of how these systems work, or we can talk about how you'd like to use them. So we've got flexibility about which way to go. Uh, which way do you guys want to go? Details? Or you've got a system that you'd like to do it with? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll look at somebody else then. <laughs> He's got a slight red flush happening there. Um, it's kind of a half fast dose. Uh, which way would you like to go? Yeah, Ellen. So the techniques that you're talking about... Um, go to the microphone, can you? Ha, ha, ha. I, I didn't want to say that right away because it would make people even more shy, but that's the way it's going to be. Go, please go to the tall microphone that short people can't reach. Apparently people in Sweden are actually taller than me. So. There you go. Hello. Um, I'm more familiar with uh, people using T-Digest, so I know that's being widely used. But uh, the whole range of techniques that you talked to about today, are they things that people are pretty standardly using, or how much of this is kind of out of the normal behavior? This is almost all out of the normal behavior. The T-Digest is being used very widely by very large systems. Uh, it's in Elasticsearch, it's in Solar, it's in a lot of software that you already use uh, in Apache Drill and Killin and, and others. But the techniques of using these things in combination so you can compare the counts is quite rare. I mean, the, the MAPR system uses it in its internal metrics. It doesn't expose the pretty diagrams yet. It does this automatically. Uh, our systems guys don't believe in users getting knobs uh, just because they turn them and, and things get bad. But uh, we will be exposing them more and more. Uh, it's, I think, something that should be used very, very widely, and I think that as the systems over the last 10 years that are in general use have become much more complex, then I think the need for this sort of capability has become much more exigent. It used to be that you could say, that's the machine that the database is running on. I could ask the database, what are the slow queries, and I could blame a user or I could blame the hardware because I could put my finger on the hardware. And I could say, this data mach machine is too hot, it's in the wrong part of the rack, or things. That's just not true anymore. Things are much more virtualized, and containers and container orchestration stuff is moving stuff around, so you really don't know. You can't point at machines anymore. People don't name things anymore, because they don't have that relationship with them. And that has made 
understanding systems much harder. And so statistical techniques like this that do magical pointing of fingers are really required. They're not optional, they're not clever and novel anymore. You've got a big system. Sure. Could you, you could use this. Yeah. Yeah, you may already use some of, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, what about you guys? You got a big system? You got users? You got measurements? He just moves his eyebrows. I was using him as a dramatic foil. I'm asking you for content. Yeah, so you should, I just ask all the naive questions here. So two questions about this. For the kinds of, for the kinds of techniques that you're talking about, who, who would be doing it? Is it the application developer? Is uh -huh. it the system administrator? That's one question. And then related to that, regardless of who it is, how hard, like I don't know how to do this stuff, so how hard are these techniques for people, you know, what kind of range of skills do you have to have to be able to do this effectively? Well, those are good questions. As you can tell she's a former academic. I only have two questions, but the first one has 27 parts. Uh, so who would use it was the first question. And I betray my bias there. I, I build systems, I, I, I build applications. I don't typically live on the user side of things. I do have people who are more on the system side than I am, but I tend to think in, in terms of the builders. But the people who build applications should use these techniques if they'd like their applications to make sense and not break in, in mysterious ways. But also, it should go all the way back practically to the drive firmware people. Uh, I think that certainly at the level of MAPR, where we're building these large-scale data platforms that can be used by thousands of people, that, that can be used to build cloud systems, it, it's absolutely required at that level. For the people who build something on top of something like that, uh, so MAPR, is, can be run in clouds, but it's, and the cloud people should and do use this sort of technique. But if you're gonna build something in a cloud or on top of a data platform, it's incumbent on you for your services to have some of these measurements as well, because you'll never know what's working or not otherwise, which means that it will be broken, mostly. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And unmanaged software is in a default state of sin meaning it will be broken. You have to prove that it's actually working. Uh, so I think that people who build systems on top of other systems are still in the position of doing that. I think once you get to where somebody's using the email or something or, or playing a piece of music or whatever, they don't need to know this because they don't have any understanding that there's a computer behind there. But just below that level, I think it's very, very important to be able to say something about what's working or not. If only so you can make more sense when you go try to take the system operators and hang them out to dry. Uh, never happens, right? Uh, and how difficult? I'm gonna repeat the question for you this time, yeah. How difficult is it? This is question two, she said. It's not hard at all. Uh, and she says it's easy for you to say, and I think that is borderline slander. But it's also probably true. Um, enter presentation mode. So what we have here is some code. Now we have the code again. It's generating data, and I'm gonna show how to, to use some of this. Here, is how you add data to a t-digest. That's tight, that's simple. If we go to the evaluation program here where we're actually looking at it, uh, it's doing a lot of things just so that I have more traceability in the test. Uh, but here is how I give it a measurement and I ask it what the quantile is. And I can go the other way, there we go. Here's how I give it a quantile and I get back to a measurement. So that's how hard the T-Digest is. There's basically three or four calls that you need to make. The stuff that does comparisons of 
counts, you need to get the counts, so you have to call the t-digest this way, and you need to put them in a little array, and you say, how weird is this array? Now, if you really cared about it, you would need to know something about that, but otherwise you can just say, big weird is worse than little weird, and that's all you really care about. And that's all those graphs were. I didn't have to explain the vertical axis. Everybody kind of got the idea that big is worse than little because when things went bad, things got big. That's how hard this is, ish. And there's a conceptual boundary to jump to decide how can I fit this into my system. But you can start right away with saying, where can I measure a latency? Where are all the places I could measure a latency? And what could I say about it? What tags could I construe? So somebody else can speak too, by the way. She's not the Please, only I'm one sorry. who gets the question. I'm just we could make the microphone higher again. So, yes, you can So just quickly, so it's very simple to set this up and without a lot of deep statistical knowledge, you can say, I mean, even I could understand that, good, bad. And you could set it up, could you set it up with just alerts that basically go bad and very bad, and once it's very bad, even if you don't have all the techniques to say, I can now look at that and figure out what it's telling me, it says go find somebody who can. Yeah, the, the alerting is probably the easiest part. The tagging is a harder part. Once you get down to the internals of the system, you've got some operation that came from somewhere, and if you don't have any hint about where it came from, all you can say is I'm writing it to this disk. Maybe I can come back a little bit and say this is part of this data structure. Uh, but if I move closer to the application, I can remember the application, I can remember the application version, I can remember the service identity that's running it. That's not hard. You just add a call at the beginning to whatever connection to the service you have that says, here's the tags I have, remember those. And then when the metrics are running and they're collecting stuff, they say, here's my unique tag combination, deal with it. So it is not hard to use these things. They're not super, super packaged yet, but it is not hard. This is cheap learning, not deep learning. How many people here have a PhD? One, three, four, a, a very small PhD person in the corner. Uh, how many people understood how that API worked? Okay, we have two different systems, we have two different counts, I can do the statistics, the numbers were different. You don't need a PhD to understand this. Doesn't mean you can't understand it if you do have a PhD, but it doesn't isn't a necessary thing. So it's, it's that level of comp complexity is you don't need fancy degrees to do this. This is not PhD work. And that's, I think, you said it yesterday, but I think that it's a, a very, very important point to make, that data is going to become part of our lives. Remember, well, maybe you don't, but 20 years ago, web design, building a little simple web page that is far worse than anybody here would ever do, was considered arcane special knowledge that only specialists had. It's like, you could build a web page. That was amazing. And then there was companies built around the fact that you could package a web con, you know, application. It's like, oh my God, that's amazing. And now it's like, oh God, that's so boring. Everybody can do that. And machine learning is about to do that. These are pieces of machine learning here. I didn't say that. I certainly didn't say AI. Because like, give me a break. It, it doesn't deserve the hype if it gets this simple. Uh, but it becomes ubiquitous then. Everybody could do this. Everybody who builds a system can easily make these measurements and can easily compare them to yesterday. And they can easily build simple little predictors that say this is what it should be now. None of that's hard. And so it should become, hopefully not in 20 years, but hopefully in three years or five years, that developers will go, well, yeah, I could compare these counts, or yeah, I could predict this. It's not that big a deal. Because it was a big deal, 
AI, machine learning has a long history. It's, it's one of the longest technologies to go from hype and hype again and hype again and hype again to, I think, now coming into early adopter stage, hopefully ubiquitous adoption soon. In these degraded, well, that's boring. You know, th that's not what I meant by a AI. I understand that. There's, there's a joke in, in these machine learning circles that AI is the term that describes all the stuff that doesn't work yet. Machine learning or logistic regression or you know, frequency comparison or all of those things, anomaly detection, are the names we give stuff that finally works. We quit calling it AI. We give it a new name because it's understood and people go, well, that's not what I meant by AI. Because basically AI is the stuff that doesn't work yet. And this has been true for 50 years. And we have these different generations of things that don't work. But more and more interesting stuff is being pulled out and being classified as, oh, that works. That's no longer AI. That's something concrete. We could just use that. And so these techniques are rapidly becoming stuff that everybody can do and everybody could just kind of make fun of because it's so easy. That's cheap learning. That's the stuff that works and is simple and doesn't deserve marketing hype. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Even those shy people out there who are looking at their shoes. Uh, I'm happy to talk afterwards uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to. Thank you very much.